Don't be shy. Step into the light. Benedict, you have described the smog yourself as a well-spoken, vainglorious, and petulant kind of character, but also vulnerable. Where is this vulnerability for you? Uh, the fact that he doesn't know his limitations. So he doesn't realise that he's vulnerable, I guess. So it's the pride before a fall aspect of his character that kind of makes him um, open to attack. I mean, literally, there is a scale missing, which, as we know, becomes a soft target potentially for someone in Lake Town. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, it's just... It, but, but within that, it... He, he throws himself into it being a target by really denying anybody having any other kind of prowess or ability. So he underestimates his opposition, he underestimates the wit and the ingenuity of Bilbo, and he underestimates what he flies into when he goes down to create havoc in Lake Town. That's for another day. As a fan of radio work, and I know that you do like doing speech work, this must be mm. a real treat for, for you. It was. I mean, even when I do cabin pressure, you know, we are still moving around and in character. Well, I, I certainly enjoy that. And that was very much the case with this because it evolved out of motion capture work. So it wasn't isolated microphone work in a darkened room. It became something from physical studying and representations of reptiles in London Zoo to using the actual dialogue that Philip Fran and Peter had adapted from this extraordinary character of Tolkien's. And... Uh, yeah, I, I began by crawling around on my belly, sandwiching my legs together like a tail and taloning up my fingers and overextending my jaw and neck to a ridiculously um, damaging degree, but to try and just emulate the serpentine movement of him, the sort of reptilian quality of him and his voice. But yeah, you decided not to, not to seek advice from Mr. Circus. Uh, it wasn't a question of not seeking advice. He, Andy was on a world as a break having directed second unit as well as playing Gollum. So he was on holiday and when he came back we had a giggle about it because obviously he's only done biped mammals and this was a new departure even for him. It would have been fresh ground but I would have loved to have um, uh, his, his, his input. Do, do, do you think that people will fully appreciate that Smog is indeed, um, well I suppose it could be taken as a modern day representation of rampant capitalism? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, kids aren't necessarily going to read that into it, but um, I think adults might. I mean, it, again, knowing your limitations, just the, the sort of unfettered greed and venality of the creature and the destruction that brings about and the careless um, disregard for anyone else's circumstance, I think resonates a lot with people who've lived through the recent financial crisis and been affected by it. Um, but it's, <laughs> having said that, I'm aware how pompous it sounds because it's a mythical creature in the middle of Middle Earth. Having said that, you know, the, these fantasy genres, not all of them survive um, one incarnation. I think the reason why fathers still read their sons and daughters this book, like, like my dad with, did with me, is because it goes beyond just the realm of mystical creatures in Middle Earth. There are, there are resonances that, you know, they're, they're very broad metaphors for, for, for the human experience. I think Bilbo is an extraordinary hero for children to encounter this quiet, stay at home. Shire bound a creature of habit who um, wants nothing more than, you know, to drink by a, a warm hearth. I mean, that's the, the, the secluded womb of a home, and then having to just throw himself out into this big, bad, ever dangerous world to find his independence is, you know, that's something that's something children do in a way. Such is the nature of evil. In time, all foul things come forth. Beast, you will destroy us all. Was that an earthquake? That, my lad, was a dragon.